cross you crucified all my sin and shame was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find my reason for living so gates of my heart the veil in between was torn apart now you hold the keys to the grave cause you bring things to life
How many of you, how many of you are called to cultural and language acquisition? Okay, there's like six hands that went up. Guess what? Let me change the way I say that. Not are you, but you are called to culture and language acquisition for the gospel. You are. You're here this morning. We're family. This is our our pep rally. This is our worship time. We come in the presence of our Father, and together we worship and praise Him so that we can leave from here and do culture and language acquisition. You're going to wake up tomorrow, and you're going to go to your job, and guess what your job really is? Culture and language acquisition. Where you are, you are made on purpose, for a purpose, exactly where you are. I am from the South. I was raised in the hills of Georgia. We speak a different language than the Pacific Northwest. (laughs) When I moved out here with my family, Thankfully, we, we realized, whoa, we were made for this. this these are our people. We kind of got chased out of the South. We didn't really fit in, didn't belong. This is where we belong. But when we came here, we had to learn language and cultural acquisition for the gospel. For me to open up the word of God right now and make it relevant, understandable, relatable, and transmittable so you can take it tomorrow into your world. Open up the book of Psalms, chapter 34. I want to encourage you, if if you haven't downloaded the app, download the app. You don't hear many preachers say this, but this, what we're doing this morning, is not the main thing. The main thing is that you wake up every morning and you spend time in the Word of God. You begin your day meditating, dwelling on the truths of God so that that can change your day. And then you end your day in the word of God, in the presence of God, thanking him for everything that he did during the day. So you begin the day, you end the day so that dwelling and meditating on the word of God will change everything in between. Do you get it? Are you dwelling in the word. Download the app. We've provided several resources. Scott, as we're praying for him, as he is going through a chemo right now, he has prepared every week a new song for you to listen to so that you can meditate and dwell on this specific song for the rest of the week. Don't miss out on that. We have a study guide and a prayer guide online that you can open up that guides you through this psalm and taking you through the head, the heart, the hands, and the hope so that you can spend time dwelling and meditating. Do you remember Psalm 27, 14? The first sermon we taught on this. Wait on the Lord. Take courage. Let your heart be strengthened, therefore wait on the Lord. Does that sound like something you need? Does doing that strengthen you and give you the courage to make it through your day, dwelling and meditating on that? That's pretty powerful. Psalm 23, verse one, this is low hanging fruit. Okay, this should be easy. Who knows Psalm 23, verse one, the the shepherding chapter. The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, Ooh, the Lord is my shepherd. Wrap your mind around that. The Lord, the creator, the almighty, the all wise one, the all knowing one, the all loving one, the good God, the creator of the world is your shepherd. Because of that, let your heart be changed. You shall not want What does your day look like if you are dwelling and meditating on that all day long? What about what Joel taught on Psalm 46, verse one? You guys remember that one? Do you remember that one? God is our strength, our refuge, and our very present help in times of trouble. I need that all day, every day. This world is shaking. 
This world is, is, is quaking, is moving. There's a lot of things going on, but guess what? We don't have to worry because we can take refuge in our good God. Is that something that will change your life if you choose to meditate and dwell on that? Come on. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. To live in gratitude. Gratitude, thankfulness, praise. Do those words characterize your day? Gratefulness, thankfulness, praise. Do those words characterize your day? This psalm is probably the most utilized psalm for me. In times of great joy, in times of celebration, actually every Sunday morning, this psalm is on my lips. This psalm encourages my heart, and you'll understand that in a little bit. But it happens every Sunday morning. It just happened. We just did Psalm 34, and it changes my heart every Sunday morning in the best of times, in the most broken of times. I've shared very openly, I have mental illness, like I, I have depression, clinical depression, like on meds, all that stuff. And I've learned to center myself on God and be very self-aware of that. And God has used that in a lot of different ways. But in 2014, I was coming off of my medication and trying to work with my mental illness the uh, all-natural hippie way. Uh, and those proteins just did not work. And in 2014, in the midst of a lot of things going on in life and me not being on medication, like I bottomed out and had a time of deep mental brokenness where every day for two months, it was hard for me to get out of bed, hard for me to leave the house, hard for me to be around people. It was Psalm 34 that I read over and over and over and over again, that lifted my head, lifted my heart, and began to change once I was able to get my heart around who God is. In times of anxiety, even this last week, had a lot of stuff that we were working through. This is the psalm that I quote over and over and over again to battle against anxiety and things that are just not dependable and just, I don't know, things are shifting and changing. Like, what do we do? This is the psalm that keeps me centered. This psalm changes my heart more than just about any other psalm. And I think in the state of our world, the unrest, the angst, the anxiety, the depression, and the anger that is so common all over the world, this psalm has something for us. Do I have your attention? Let's go. I love this psalm. Right off the bat, I will bless Yahweh at all times. Okay, in your Bibles, I wrote up there Yahweh, but in your Bibles it says what? Lord. And it's written, the type is what? All capitals. So anytime you see that, you need to know that the word there is not Adonai, which means Lord. Anytime you see it capitalized, that is the sacred name of God that they consider to be unspeakable. You don't say his name. It's so holy, it's so precious. You'd never dare to say it in vain and, and you would barely even write it. But here David is using this sacred name to express deep intimacy. I will bless Yahweh at all times. Do you do that? Gratitude. I will bless Yahweh at all times. David is saying, I am knowing who you are. I'm acknowledging that. I'm acknowledging what you have done, and I am blessing you for the great name that you have for who you are. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. There will never be a time during my day that I am not praising him. 
This is not a verse. This is a lifestyle. And while I can just stop preaching here, this is the big golden, golden nugget. If you can learn how to do this, to bless God at all times, to let his praise be continually on your lips, your life will be changed. It will change the way you see everything. This is not a verse. This is a lifestyle. The Hebrew people, the Old Testament, you read all of this reputation of God's interaction and how he showed up, how he proved faithful in spite of Israel's lack of faithfulness. God graciously did not wipe them off the face of the earth, but continued to hold fast to his covenants and express his love to them. God is dependable. God is faithful. He is worthy of blessing at all times. That's what David was saying. You keep reading, and the Israelites were known as the Hebrew people. The nation was split, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Israel, north, south. And it wasn't until 600 B.C., that the Israelites, the Hebrews, became known as the Jews. It wasn't until Mordecai, after Queen Esther saved the nation of Israel from genocide, from slavery, from death, she stepped in and was used by God to save the nation of Israel. And then Israel stood free and alive, and Mordecai said, Uda Vailohenu. Thankfulness be unto God. Uda. Thankfulness. Which is taken from the word Judah, the tribe of Judah, which means praise. Praise and thankfulness. To be Jewish is to be a person of praise and thankfulness. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my lips. It is my lifestyle. How grateful would you be if all of our lives were on the line and someone stepped in to save us from slavery, to save us from death, to save us from genocide? Would you be a little thankful? If that happened right now, do you think you would spend the rest of your life every day thanking the person who saved you? Jesus did that for you. Little secret here. Jesus did that for you. Now, the Jewish people, they would wake up, have a time of prayer, midday, a time of prayer, the end of the day, a time of prayer. They made sure there was time for prayer and concentrated meditation. But guess what happened all through their day? Every day, all day, at least a hundred times, they would find a reason to stop and say, blessed are you, king of the universe, for waking me up in the morning. Thank you for giving me breakfast, for giving me this food. Thank you, God, king of the universe, for this wine, for this water, for this life, for this job. Over a hundred times, they would utter this prayer. Thank you, blessed are you, God, king of the universe. Over a hundred times, they lived a lifestyle of generosity and praise. How about you? Have you incorporated that lifestyle into your life? Listen to this. In 2008, scientists conducted a study to measure the brain activity of people thinking and feeling gratitude. What they found was that gratitude causes synchronized activation in multiple brain regions. And it lights up parts of the brain's reward pathways in the hypothalamus. In short, gratitude can boost the neurotransmitter serotonin and activate the brain stem to produce dopamine. Dopamine is our brain's pleasure chemical. So the more we think positive, grateful thoughts, the healthier and happier people we will be. It's, it's almost as if David and the Jews, and it's almost as if God knew what he was talking about. <laughs> if you can incorporate this into your life to be a lifestyle, I will bless, I will thank the Lord at all times. His praise will continuously be on my mouth. My soul, listen to this, my head has gotten around who God is so that it changes my heart. My heart, my soul makes its boast in Yahweh. 
Because of who God is, I have a heart response. Is that true for you? When you get your head around who God is, does your heart follow in response? Because here David says, my soul makes us boast in Yahweh. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then he calls out to his brothers and sisters and says, oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. Think of the power of what's happening just in these three verses. If you can learn to live a lifestyle where you are blessing the Lord at all times and allowing his praise to continuously be on your lips, is that gonna change your heart? When you yourself meditate and get your mind around the greatness of who God is, does that in yourself solicit a praise? Let me just ask you right now, just in your minds, in your hearts, has God been good to you? Can you say, praise the name of God in your minds? Can, can you feel that? Okay, hold on to that. What has he done? How has he been good to you? How has he proven to be faithful, to be God Almighty, to be in charge, to come through and to give you a reason to say, bless his name, praise the name of God. Do you have a reason to be thankful? Okay, carry that together. You all have a reason. Now you are sitting together as a corporate family of God. So now I want to ask you publicly in front of your brothers and sisters, do you have a reason to be thankful and grateful for who God is? Can you right now out loud say, bless the name of God? Praise the name of God. Okay. Now you think about it. We heard some people saying, praise the name of God. He's asking me to say it. I'm going to say it. I know I've got to say it. Praise the name of God. Then you've got some other people that are like that. I saw one person with her hand up. Praise the name of God. Your heart will boast in accordance to your understanding of who God is in your life. And we have some people that are more excited about the power of God than others. Does that challenge you? Okay, so let me try this again. Think about what God has done for you. Can you praise the name of God? Let's hear you say it. That was a little louder. One more time. In accordance to what God has done to you, praise the name of God. All right, Whoa, that's getting a little out of control. We have baptistic roots. Don't get all charismatic on me, okay? No, actually, I'm fine with that. Let's go, let's go. If God has been that great, I've got a lot to praise God for. And I stand here every Sunday declaring the goodness of God. And no matter what has happened this last week, no matter what I've encountered, I'm gonna stand here in this solid truth because God continues to be faithful, so I will praise the name of God. And when we hear each other praising the name of God, our individual understanding of who God is, and we bring that into this corporate environment, you should be encouraged by each other's praise. Are you encouraged by each other's praise? You should talk to someone in this room and ask them, what is the story of God's faithfulness in your life? And you will be blown away. Your individual praise, your individual thankfulness, your individual greatness bolsters our corporate praise, which in turn bolsters our individual praise. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continuously be on my lips. I will be grateful and live in this attitude of gratefulness, which physiologically will fight against anger, angst, anxiety, and depression. So when you find yourself in moments of those, bless the Lord at that time. And it will begin to shift things because when you get your head around who God is, your heart will have a solicited response by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that will drive your hands to action. Listen to this, what we see next. I've underlined these action words. Whose responsibility do these action words fall on? 
I sought Yahweh and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man (laughs) cried out and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angels of Yahweh encamp around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. If you get your head around who God is and he starts transforming your heart, changing your heart, giving you a heart of thankfulness and gratefulness and gratitude, then that will translate into hands of action. I sought the Lord. And what happened to that person who sought the Lord? There was an answer given by God. What happened to those who looked to him? Well, those who looked to him, God entered into their story and changed their faces and made them radiant so that they would not be put to shame. Those who cried to Yahweh, those cries were heard by God and he answered him. So this is an interesting thing. God calls us based on getting our heads around him, our heart's response, our hands being active When we do something, then we get to see God do something. Do you see that? All through here, God through David said, do these things and you will see me do something good. But I'm asking you to take the next step of faith and to take what your head and your heart is learning and apply it to activity. And if you do this, you will see me do something greater. What happens when we don't do? If we don't do something, then we won't see him do anything. And when you think about this and you think about the challenge of this lifestyle, that we are to build a lifestyle of gratitude and thankfulness and allow our hearts to be changed and enter into activity, we go all the way back to the beginning of this. We find what unravels so many of our faith and so much of our life experience when we think, God, where are you? And God's sitting up there like, I don't know, you haven't talked to me in like a week and a half. You haven't thought of me. You haven't reminded yourself of who I am. You're living life blind because you're living life on your own. You're not opening up my word and reminding yourselves of the truths of God. You're not talking to me. You're not praying to me. You're not dwelling on these truths and allowing me to work in your life. And you're not stepping into activity. You're not crying out to me. You're not looking to me. You're not seeking me. Which lifestyle Describes which you are, because I guarantee most of the time when I talk to someone who is frustrated and feeling like God has no answers, it's because there is severe inactivity and disconnection with their loving Father. Get your head around who He is, allow Him to change your heart so you step into activity. This third thing, which is sometimes a little confusing, the angel of Yahweh camps around those who fear Him. And he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear Yahweh, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek Yahweh lack no good thing. Come, oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of Yahweh. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? What, what, what's the reoccurring message that you hear in that? Fear God, fear God, fear God, fear God. Makes us a little uncomfortable. What does that mean? Now listen to this. Now keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Now here's some straight lines of activity, things that you are supposed to do 
And it says that these things are supposed to be done in response to the fear of God. What does the fear of God mean? I thought God was my buddy. I thought Jesus died so I could get the warm fuzzies and just kind of cuddle in and turn on my worship music and like, where is fear in any of that? The fear of God. When you're afraid of something, what do you do? Let's say, how many of you have a natural fear it's something that's very, that's woven into our existence, I feel like. How many of you have a fear of lions, like an appropriate fear of lions? Really? <laughs> You're telling me that most of you are, I don't want to use the word. Um, how many of you have an appropriate fear of lions? How many of you are willing to jump into a lion's pit right now? Okay, how many are you willing to stay on the other side of the plexiglass, stay behind the bars and thank God Almighty for that big pit dug in front of you at the zoo? Because you all have a f healthy fear of lions. And that fear tells you to stay away. But a godly fear, listen to this, a godly fear produces integrity and intimacy. Okay, this is interesting. A godly fear produces integrity. A godly fear puts you right before your creator to where you understand who he is, you understand his ways, and you are fearful of him and getting out of his ways because you know that's a bad place to be. And thinking through that produces integrity in your life and it actually draws you into intimacy. You see this expressed in The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Anyone read C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia? Love that, grew up reading those books. Okay, Aslan is the representation of God, and Aslan is the great king, the lion. And Lucy comes to Narnia for the first time and is talking to all these animals, which is weird enough, right? But they're telling her about Aslan, this lion, and he is the great king that they're waiting for. And she, being a human, in her right mind is like, Okay, a lion, is he safe? Now listen to what Mr. Beaver says. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king, I tell you. He's to be feared, but his fear puts your soul in check to produce integrity that creates intimacy. How, how many of you are nerds like me and you've, you've watched Forged in Fire, that TV show, all right? Yeah, okay, great TV show, okay? It's the same thing over and over again, but it's great, okay? So it's these people that get this raw metal and they put it into a furnace and they heat the metal up and they take it out while it's red hot and start slamming hammers on it banging it out into the shape of a sword or a knife. Now, while that metal is in the furnace, in the fire, that steel is going through a chemical change. It is being changed from the inside out. It comes out of that furnace, furnace chemically separated, and they are able to make it more malleable, to lay it out, to put it into the shape of a sword. And once it's in the shape of a sword, is it ready to go to battle? No. Because what they do next is while it's in the shape of a sword, they put it back into the furnace, heat it up again, get those chemicals moving around, loosening up. Then they take it out while it's just the right temperature, white hot, and then they dip it into an oil to rapidly bring it down to temperature. And as it is rapidly returning to temperature, that steel is once again changing and hardening. They take it out of that quench and they scrape it and they listen to it and it will make a specific noise as it's being scraped so that they know it is chemically changed, bonded to each other in a way that is solid and should be safe for battle. So do they then take it into battle? No, they do not. They take it through another process of shaving it down, of, of making it look nice and shiny and sharpening the edges. 
now that it looks like a sword and feels like a sword, is it ready to go into battle? Again, I tell you no. Because then they took, they take that knife or that sword and they begin to test it to see if it has integrity. To make sure that that steel from bottom to the top is completely unified, completely hardened, and will endure. So they take what they had worked on for days, weeks, sometimes months, and they begin to slam it into other pieces of metal and wood and stone. Can you imagine? Something that you've worked so hard on, you just begin wailing on it to see if it has integrity to see if it has been changed to its core. And if it hasn't, if there's a crack inside of the metal that they can't see, if it lacks integrity, it will break, which is actually a good thing because it's better to break in the testing than on the battlefield. But if the sword tests and is strong and shows integrity, then it is given to a king, it is given to a knight, and they take it into battle and they exercise it again. They put their life on the line of the sword and they come back from the battlefield and it's lived, it's it's helped them live, it's survived and they survived. They take it back to a battlefield again and they grow a relationship with this sword because they have depended so much on it and they trust in the integrity and that integrity produces intimacy. And we know this historically because King Arthur had a sword whose name was Excalibur. The dude named his sword. That's weird. Unless you know that he built a relationship that was the product of integrity. Thor named his hammer, named it Meow Meow. I don't know, that's as close as I can get. I can't say it the right way. But he named it Frodo. Sting, Uh, Gandalf, oh yeah, that one's harder to pronounce, Glandril, Orc Hammer. These swords were named because they had integrity. They endured the fire. The fire produced integrity. The integrity produced intimacy. Do you see it? An appropriate fear of God will, like a furnace, burn you to your core. Bring out the impurities so they can be dealt with so you can now live a life that is naturally expressive of the greatness and goodness of God. And there's an integrity that comes about so that you want to keep your tongue from evil. You want to keep your lips from speaking deceit. You want to turn away from evil and do good and to seek peace and pursue it because that's who you are and the integrity of your heart because you endured the fire, because you got your head around who God was and he changed your heart, activated your hands and now because of that, you have an integrity of faith that is in line with God that has survived the fire and that integrity produces intimacy where you draw near to the one you fear. And that is a beautiful thing. The scenes of this movie where you see Lucy cuddle into a lion, bury herself in a lion's mane. I don't know if you've ever seen a a tiger handler, a lion handler, not talking about the Tiger King because he's crazy, but if you've watched someone at a zoo who has a relationship with a lion, I'm jealous because this guy is chilling with the lion. That's the opportunity you have in Christ through fear and integrity and therefore intimacy. Now look at this. This is beautiful. Look at what is underlined because this is God expressing himself to you. This is what you can depend on. Every single one of these underlined words are full of faith. This will happen. There's not a question mark on any one of these. Listen to this. The eyes of Yahweh are toward you. The eyes of God Almighty are towards you, the righteous, and his ears are toward your cry. 100% confident you can put your life on it. His ears are towards their cry. The face of Yahweh is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, Yahweh hears and delivers. You can put your life on it. 
He delivers them out of all their troubles. Yahweh is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteousness, but Yahweh delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Yahweh redeems. What does he do? He redeems some of the time. Can you trust him for it? What is he doing to you? What will he do to you? Yahweh redeems. Can you just say that out loud for yourself? Yahweh redeems. That is his guaranteed activity in your life. The life of his servants, not one of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. David, once he was able to live a life of gratitude, get his head around who God was, allow his heart to be changed to a heart of praise, to go through the furnace, to live in activity, to have a life of integrity that produces intimacy, through that relationship, he learned God will come through every time. So what are you worried about? Anxiety, depression, angst, and anger are the byproducts, they are the byproducts of unbelief, of a lack of confidence. But if you have confidence in who he is, think about this, if you have confidence that he will do every single one of these things in your life, then what are you anxious for? What are you depressed about? And I'm speaking to myself. This is why this psalm comes back to me all the time. I have to bring myself back into a place of confidence before a trustworthy, dependable God. Me and my family, and as we start to wrap this up, me and my family, we, we go on vacations. We like to do crazy, stupid things. So we were driving around this one area. My wife researched and found out that if you go on this hike, you get to this place, there's a 40-foot cliff that you can jump off of into a big body of water and thought this would be great family activity. So we went, we got there. I was actually excited because like, I remember jumping off a cliff for the first time when I was like 16 in Jamaica. It was amazing. It was like a 50 foot cliff. I was like, yes, this is gonna be awesome. I've done this in Peru. Like I've jumped off of cliffs all over the world. Haven't done it for a while. So like now that I'm 40, whatever years old that I was, I was standing on the edge of a cliff and I was like, this is really dumb. <laughs> what do I have to prove? I've done this before. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Like I, I wanted to jump, but everything inside of me was like, you are an idiot. And then I turned around and I see my bullies. Nope. My oldest son gets up, looks, boom. You know, like an 18 year old with a malformed brain, he just jumps off the cliff. And then my 16 year old, who has never had the spiritual gift of fear, just goes running without even looking, just sends it, just jumps off. And then I'm up there alone. And my family's winning me to the side and they're like, dad, you're the great one. You're, you've taught us how to, you're like, where, what do you? And they, I'm just standing there for minutes. And then I see my oldest son literally standing there. I'm like, someone hasn't done that since the third grade. That's not gonna work on me, but it worked on me. I was, I was like, okay, I guess I do have something to prove. And I finally got up and I jumped. And it was amazing. And you never jump once. You swim around and you jump again. And you jump again. Because it's been tested, it's been proven, you know you can do it. Cascade, Psalm 34 is God's invitation to stand on the cliff and stop being filled with anxiety, angst, fear, and anger and just jump into his trustworthy arms. Your father is sitting on the other side of that cliff, arms open wide, and he says, you have nothing to fear. Trust me, have a blast. This is what you were made for. Are you ready to jump? Psalm 34. How are you living, Cascade? Psalm 34, you were made for this. Practice a posture of gratitude. Let it be your lifestyle. Know who he is. Get your head around it. Activate your relationship with Yahweh. 
Jump in and get started. There are things to do. Integrate integrity for intimacy with him. Let him put you through the fire. Let him purify you of your old self so you can be made new, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can stand in integrity before God, your creator, so that you can live intimacy with intimacy with him. And all of that so you can walk in the confident hope of who he is. Are you confident? Do you know what he has done for you? Has he proven to be a good God? If you needed any proof, then it says at just the right time, Jesus chose to demonstrate his love to you in this way that he sent his son while you were dead in your sins. At that moment, he sent his son to die for you. He was broken for you. Just like Esther stepping into the world, he saved you from brokenness, from death, from enslavement to sin. And through his blood, he forgives you, he redeems you, and breathes new life. If you ever needed a moment, to pause, to meditate, and to dwell on his goodness. This is the invitation. Hold on to these elements. Get your head around who he is. Allow your heart to respond to his goodness. Hold on to these and we'll take them at the end of the song.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Are you grateful? Are you thankful for what you can only find in him? Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken for us, that was broken instead of us. Jesus, you took on the weight of our sins and the full measure of the wrath of God and you were broken so that we would not be broken. Jesus, thank you for your work on the cross. Jesus, just as we sang, it is only in your blood. Only you could be the eternal sacrifice for us because only you walked without sin. You were the only spotless lamb of God. So it could only be you to lay your life down so that your blood, the shedding of your blood, would give us forgiveness and place your righteousness on us so that we are made right and holy and blameless before our Father. Jesus, thank you for your blood and the work that you did for us. Take this and drink. We take communion to get our head around who Jesus is, allow our hearts to respond to his goodness so that our hands can be activated and our hope for ourselves and the world can be in line with the kingdom of God. We started this off talking about the giving of finances. We talked about the giving of our lives and volunteering. You are the church. You are the body. You are the reflection of God to a hurting and broken world. So whenever we take communion, we immediately turn our hearts to the activity that God has called us to. I want to invite you to sit down and to watch this video that, that shows you a little more of who God is. And as we show this video, we're going to take up this offering, which goes completely out the door to be the activities that God has called us to. So watch this video so you know where this is going. Hi, my name is Sue Skillen, and I'm the executive director of the Monroe Public Schools Foundation and have been for the past 15 years. And I'm Kathy Jackson, and I serve as a family liaison for the Monroe School District, and I'm also a member here at Cascade. If a student is facing challenges in school, I assist them by providing guidance on the best course of action to help the student overcome those challenges. And I get to serve as an advocate for students and families to make sure that they have the necessary resources and that they're available to every student in need. Some of the ways we support students and families include addressing clothing needs, providing eye exams and eyewear, partnering with the Sky Valley Food Bank, making sure children have shoes, providing books and educational resources, and adopting families for Christmas gift giving. Having a reliable and responsive support system in the community can make a tremendous difference. Cascade Church is that support system. I have a deep appreciation for you and your contributions have been invaluable. I know I can always call out Cascade for help and I appreciate that so much. Please continue to be generous with the community care ministry at Cascade. If you're interested in learning more about our organization or how you can serve with us, visit our website at MonroePSF.org. Thank you so much for your support, Cascade Church. The over and above offering that you give today and every Communion Sunday goes directly to meet the needs in Monroe. You can give by placing the offering in the bags or online selecting the Community Care Fund. If you're aware of a need in the community and want to be part of the solution, please reach out to me at Kimberly.Clem at CascadeChurch.org and visit CascadeChurch.org forward slash here near far to learn more. Thank you for supporting the Community Care Ministry here at Cascade. Hey there, my name is Kirk and I serve as the executive pastor here at Cascade. If this was your first time joining us, welcome. We're so glad that you watched the service today. If you're new or even if you're not new, would you take a moment to fill out the Digital Connect card in the description of this video? We would love to reach out and answer any questions that you have about Cascade Church. We're here every Sunday and would love for you to become a part of our church family in person here in Monroe. We're committed to being followers of Jesus and disciples who make more disciples by being in community and growing in our knowledge and understanding of God together. There are so many places to connect and find community. I wanna encourage you to join a community group and start living life together. You can learn more about community groups by scanning this QR code or visiting the Cascade app or cascadechurch.org. 
Cascade at the River is coming up. Every year, we gather as a church family for a day of fun and games, food, and celebrating baptisms together. We'll gather at the Froning Farm here in Monroe from 12.30 to 5 p.m. on Saturday, August 19th. Add this one to your calendar, you won't want to miss it. Thank you for being faithful and obedient in the giving of your tithes and offerings. I want to encourage you to continue to do so by using the website and the app. You can also give in person here at Cascade or placing a check in the mail. Before you go, would you hit like on this video, subscribe to our channel, and share it with a friend? It's an easy way to help more people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks again for being a part of our Cascade family. Have an awesome day and we'll see you next week.